and a very, very happy, happy Friday. Now, I am excited because in celebration of today, and also to a happy, slightly belated book birthday, but we have Elliot Schrafer, who is celebrating the darkness outside us. A very large round of applause, please, virtually. And Elliot is going to be in conversation with Adam Silvera. Now, both of these authors are amazing New York Times best-selling authors, many great books under their belts. But I am excited because The Darkness Outside Us feels a little bit different than the other books you've had come out, Elliot. And I'm not going to give too much away, but there was, I so like seldom read blurbs, but I love this little like summation. And it says, for The Darkness Outside Us, that it is, they both die at the end, meets the loneliest girl in the universe in this mind bending sci-fi mystery and tender love story about two boys aboard a spaceship sent on a rescue mission from two-time National Book Award finalist Elliot Schrafer. Now, if that isn't everything we like at our store in one book, I don't know <laughs> what is. So I am so excited. I'm going to go ahead. Adam is a amazing conversational host. So I'm, I mean, you know, he's, he's only a couple, only a couple of these. Yeah. But um, before I pass it off to him, just to give everyone the house rules to the right hand side, we have our chat section. Hello to everyone there. Thank you for all of the love. Keep it coming. And then also for events, yes, all of the pointing. For events, if you look down below where it says ask a question, that is indeed where you can ask a question. I would highly, highly prompt you to take advantage of that to pry the author's brains. It's the best part of events is you get to interact with them. And also you may be wondering, where can I purchase this amazing sci-fi mystery, YA, all of the great things combined into one book? And that is a great question. If you look down below, there's a purchase book button, and that is where you can purchase Elliot's book as well as Adam's books, but the darkness outside. One more round of applause, huzzah! And I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you, Adam. I'll see you guys at the end of the event. Yay! Hey. Oh, we just, like, switched. We got big. Videos. Okay, yeah. cool. Witchcraft, um, how are you? Happy release week. I am good. Thank you, Adam. It is. I am so honored to be in conversation with you. You have so much going on, and it is just like, you were my cop title, and yeah. now you're here talking to me about the book. So. I, I love it. Now we're like, we're, I mean, we are publisher siblings, um, and, and yeah, but I mean, how has the release week been for you so far? Oh. Re having a book released during this era is so odd because you just spend days liking things on Instagram, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, 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 I think the book is real. Like, I, I've, I've touched a copy, right. and yet it's like so much about, you know, the social media engagement, which was already part of it, but yeah, I mean, it's really heady. But like, I, I've been down in my mom's, I'm visiting my mom down in Clearwater, Florida, and it's like, no one knows I'm not in New York City doing all right. this. Right. Yeah, I know. So I was like, where are you right now? I was like, <laughs> sorry, my dog just arrived. Oh, uh, can you see? He's, oh, he's, yeah, I mean, he's very right. just cute and Taz. Great. Hey, Papa. <laughs> hey, thank you for coming to my, my <laughs> Taz. We'll take questions from Taz, too. Yep. Um, but, okay, so I know that we just got a little bit of a kind of like a, a teaser to like what the book is about, but do you want to give a more sort of like in-depth uh, summary on like what the book is and like who our main characters are? Yeah, sure. Um, so The Darkness Outside is, which, it covers everywhere, but here's another one. Um, is a, it takes place 400 years in the future, uh, and Earth at that point is locked into a cold war between only two remaining nations. Um, and they've sent off a star astronaut, her name is Minerva Cusk, and she's settling Titan, the inhabitable moon of Saturn. And um, she goes and lands, the, the two countries like break their cold war and unite to celebrate this astronaut who's gonna colonize Titan, and then her signal goes dark, and everyone mourns and assumes that she's she's dead and she's lost forever. Um, that's before the book begins. When the book begins, um, they're scrambling a rescue mission because her distress beacon on Titan has tripped and gone off. Um, and there's no text, they just know that it's been manually triggered. And so the two countries don't have the resources on their own to send a ship, so they wind up putting one astronaut from each country on board. Um, and their names are Ambrose and Kodiak. Um, and the two countries of Earth are, are basically like my futuristic version of Athens and Sparta. Um, Ambrose, oh, fun. Is, yeah, it's from the like philosophical, poetic. Um, there, he almost got a tattoo that said like all pronouns are violence. You know, he's like 
like, oh, like the, the dream future for the progressive yeah. country. Um, and then Kodiaks from a much more uh, repressive, hyper traditional, hyper masculine society. Um, and so they have to figure out how to relate enough in order to do this rescue mission. And this book is a little hard to talk about um, because everything changes at some point in the book. And I, I won't say how it changes, hopefully. Okay. Um, if I had had like the glass of wine at dinner before I did this, I probably <laughs> would have changed was. You would have just been but, dishing everything right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. I'm sober, so I'm not going to give away the plot twist, I promise. <laughs> well, I'm super excited to get to it. Like, I'm already, uh, I started reading a bit of it today, um, and I'm loving it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely does feel like a um, shift in tone for you. So, like, what was, like, the initial, um, like, inspiration for it? Like, how did this premise, like, come about? Especially, like, knowing, like, being very familiar with, um, your very um, earth-centric uh, novels um, before this one, like how did you decide like, okay, I'm gonna write a space book? Yeah, right. I, I guess so So the books I'm most known for are all about animals in some way. So the yeah. Great Ape Quartet was realistic stories about young people and great apes. Um, and that my book before this is The Animal Rescue Agency, which is about a uh, debonair, Lady Love this cover and her, so rooster, much. her rooster assistant saving animals around the world. It's a little bit different as far as books go than than the darkness outside is, but I think the roots of darkness outside is there's there's two places it comes from. Um, one is when I was in college and I went on like Friday night with some friends to see what lies beneath, which is this really forgettable Harrison Ford Michelle Pfeiffer thriller, um, where it's all predicated on like, we don't know what Harrison Ford is up to and neither does Michelle Pfeiffer, it's sort of Hitchcockian. And so you're trying to, as the audience, you're coming up with theories for what's really going on. And I hashed a theory uh, as I was watching this movie and I was sure that I was gonna be right. And I was not, like it was <laughs> totally, totally off base. I had a sci-fi theory for what was actually going on in this book and this was not a sci-fi movie. And so I liked my crackpot theory way better. So for 20 years, ever since I saw that movie, that, that plot i was looking for it anywhere in like books in movies tv shows and i i never found a, that story told so it kind of got stuck inside me like i want to tell it um so that was yeah. half of the origin okay uh, and the other half of the origin is sort of the realization about romantic relationships that you know you it's not always about waiting to find the right person it's finding the right person at the right time when you've developed the right equipment to be with that person. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, especially like thinking back to my teenage self. So because I'm actually in the apartment where I was a teenager, um, I, I very transporting experience. Of teenage oh my God. <laughs> oh my, God. It, my friend. Yeah. You do not age. <laughs> well, that's because we're on camera. Okay. <laughs> uh, but my friends used to call me, I can't believe it's not a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Because I worked at the Gap and you got half off, so I was like all Gap all the time with like a braided leather belt. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, but in high school, I did end up dating my best friend, turned into my boyfriend. But neither of us were equipped to figure out how to how to work a relationship. And so yeah. I keep thinking that like there's ways in which it could be over forever with someone, but it, in other circumstances, it might have worked out and not to give away the plot twist because I didn't have wine at dinner. Um, there is a way in which Ambrose and Kodiak have a chance to renegotiate their relationship. Um, okay. Cause if you can tell from the cover, these boys are going to wind up kissing. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it's, it's, they're already two inches away, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but it runs in different ways depending on the, how the situation changes that they're in. And then, so we're for the dynamics, like between them, like were those, um, pulled from like realistic, like, or, or like real um, experiences that like you had, or were you just kind of like sketching them from the ground up? Uh, I kind of was sketching them from the ground up. I, cool. This is actually the first time I've had a romance in a book that I've written. Um, I think- Oh, because, wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I mean, the fox and the rooster weren't gonna do that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the human and the monkey were either. Right, so. you get on a, a band book list real quick when you start playing. Right. But wait, this is like, what what book number is this for you? Uh, I'm not sure. Like, I was gonna say, I was like, do you even know? Like up until like there was like eight books, it was like I felt proud with everyone, and then after eight, I was like kind of like oh, 
like you feel a little embarrassed about right. I think probably 15 or 16 books, but some of them are really short. So Okay, sure. But they count. <laughs> yeah. um, so okay, cool. So so the, but the, out of all of those 15, 16 or 20 or 10, like this is your first time writing romance. Yeah. Endangered, the first book in the Ape Quartet actually had one in originally. Um and then it was a really fumbling, terrible romance. And my editor, David Levitham, was like, why is this here? And I was like, I thought I had to. And he's like, no, you don't. And I was like, oh, thank God. So I cut the romance. There was a German intern that Sophie fell in love with. Um, oh, and, fun. But yeah. Um, and I think I just have like a sort of like, you know, re repressed nature around like being sensational around romantic feelings and things, you know, I'm like, I'm half English. <laughs> so yeah. we're very tight lipped about that sort of stuff. Um, but in this case, it seems so right for this story to be also through this plot line, looking at ways of connecting romantically. But yeah, it, it, it's so interesting to just sort of like think about the sort of isolating um, component of this novel, especially given like the year um, that we just had. So what was the editorial process like for you? Like, were you still kind of editing um, or like going through like final revisions for this book? right as like quarantine and stuff like began um did that at all affect anything um for for the book itself yeah um i had drafted the book before the pandemic which is actually kind of too bad because in a in the way like the mood matched the pandemic um, right. instead during 2020 i was drafting the second book of the animal rescue agency which was supposed to be this like caper hilarious like our oh, adventure all the time and instead this fox and rooster were like getting into fights and like there's, questioning there's like, like there's roadkill <laughs> 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 mr pepper where are you oh no <laughs> um, <laughs> but and and they were like why do we rescue animals they're just going to get stuck again like it's just it's useless you know so oh that was God, that yeah. was a tough match um whereas the darkness outside is is about being shut into an enclosed space with someone you love and figuring out how to keep you know keep strong together um which is so much so many people's journey over the last yeah. year and a half right um yeah. so i was in edits for it uh, during that but okay. on, on your um on your romance question i i took advantage of the fact that ya has so many great romance writers in it you know so yeah. i i had this conception with ambrose and kodiak um that ambrose is this really enlightened guy and kodiak is so shut down emotionally that ambrose is totally turned off by it like he needs that emotional connection to be attracted to someone and yeah uh, but i mean kodiak is like this brooding super super handsome like i just go there's like two page descriptions of like how handsome he is oh uh, yeah so, so i was i remember i was at the um at a holiday party with ya writers and um, they were writing romances and i was like all right is this a romance cliche if like the guy is really hot, but he's just not right for this person. So they're like, oh yeah, for another person, this would be like the perfect man, but it's not not the guy for me. And they're like, it's it's done, but not overdone. So I think you're safe to do cool. it. Cool. Yeah. So, so that was that was the foundation for their relationship. But also I, I feel like even when, especially as we're writing about like queer romances or any sort of um, thing that feels like kind of cliche, I think that by just sort of telling stories that aren't told from that like white, straight, cisgender perspective that like it's, automatically going to feel fresh, right? And uh, so, I mean, I, I like, I wouldn't even like worry about that. Like uh, you go use whatever cliche you want um, and go roll with it because it's going to be already like significantly different than like everything else that we've like seen um, on shelves the past like, you know, millennia. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like I was like, I'm not at all like concerned. I, I wonder now, like even if I had heard this description and it was about like a boy and a girl. Um, if I would have been like, oh, I feel like I've like heard that before. And I'm like, no, like that never once crossed my mind like when I came across like this premise. Um, and you know, that's, it's something I think about too because with They Both Die at the End, I almost wrote it as a love story between a boy and a girl um, because this was like years before like we were really starting to see improvement with, um, you know, uh, diversity and prioritizing like marginalized voices that I was like, is anyone going to read this if I write it about like queer boys of color or is it just going to be um, just completely buried, right? And I was like, I, I want to tap into the same people who read The False in Our Stars, right? Mm -hmm. And who, who read these like doomed loves and everything. And the only reason I didn't was because I couldn't decide on the name for the girl that I like. Um, and I had, the, okay. 
I had the names for the two boys I both liked. And I was like, what if I just use those and I just told this the way I want to tell it, right? Was right. that something that you had considered for yourself at any point, thinking like, oh, like, should I make this a queer thing? Should I make it straight so it's more mainstream, accessible and everything? Like, did you have those kind of feelings? Um, I didn't really. I think I, I knew story-wise and, and genre-wise for what I was writing that this book was so different than anything I had written. So that I was... right. I, I thought of it as my like high risk project, right? That could totally bomb, um, and but might succeed. And therefore I was, I wanted to take all the risks. I wanted to push the storytelling as far as I could and get these boys into like just the situation I wanted to have them and not, yeah. not make safe choices. Um, so. I it, love that. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear you say that, especially in pride month of all, of all times, right? So just be like, no, I'm just gonna go for it. You know, because I, I think that that is sort of the most, um, you know, just like rewarding experience, like regardless, right? Because like, I like I, I think about They Both Die at the End too, where I'm just like, man, if that book like had succeeded um, at a Fault in Our Stars level and it was about like a straight couple, I would have felt shitty about that. Like mm -hmm. I would have been like, oh, so you guys just couldn't invest in like queer characters in the same way, right? Whereas now I get to like feel kind of proud that it's like, okay, cool, like people care about them. And You'd have like a JK Rowling moment at a Adam Silvera con where you were like, well, actually, I thought of them as queer, even though, you know. Right, no, exactly. And, and then I was gonna be like, they're okay, cool, cool, sorry. <laughs> no, because it, it, it would have, it, that would have sucked. And that would have felt like such a betrayal to my soul, you know, because I think that like we, we do have to make that consideration. It is like a conscious choice where it's like, okay, are we going to write um, an identity that like reflects our own or are we going to write for the masses? You know, whatever that may mean to every individual writer. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, you know, cause like there are some, libraries and bookstores and in you know several states that like aren't going to stock our books <laughs> you know so we have to like consider that like oh we are writing for people who um you know writing in a country that isn't going to be fully accepting of these stories or aren't even going to like give it a chance yeah. right and so it is a big it is a big risk yeah well you know the flip side of that though is that because there's a there there is going to be a general push away from these stories and like within the super mainstream that you are going to have people fight even harder like meeting the librarians and booksellers who yeah. really fight double hard for this these books to get into hands has been yeah. really tiring. so it's you, you get both sides with it um, no, i mean yeah we absolutely we're we get the champions for sure and i'm just like i like and i'm always so grateful but man it's always just such a point of like because i'm like i've exclusively written just queer characters for all, all my books so far and um and i hope to keep that up but like uh yeah i just uh it, it, i just hate that it's even a thought that we have to think yeah. about because well, like i'm so glad you made that choice because i mean it's like number one on the bestseller list three years yeah. after the book came out right i mean yeah. amazing right. uh, for, for on all sides, like queer representation, and I'm really glad for you and your bank account. Thank you. Yeah, also, by the way, so Elliot and I met, like, I mean, well, we met, like, forever ago, but, like, we had, like, a really great trip together with a bunch of other authors um, in 2014, December 2014. Um, a bunch of authors, we went to uh, Germany. I was like, I almost said Georgia. Um, and, Deutschland, what is it in English? Yeah, and it was so, like, why were we there? They were just, like... It was no one. We we spent ten days being taken around different German cities by our our by the the German embassy, the German consulate. Yeah. And, um. We, even by the end, none of us knew why we'd been invited, and we had a theory <laughs> that Germans for so often in children's literature were the bad guys that they wanted to bring out children's lit authors to like show them like, look, Germans are really nice. Like, don't stop making us villains. Yeah. But, I don't have any evidence for that theory, but I can't see why else they took us on all expenses page. But, but they never did it again. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, it, it was just this thing where it was like, I think, you know, they had us meeting with like different um, publishers out in Germany as well to sort of like see what their experience was like. You look, you match your cover beautifully right now. Right? I'm turning, I'm turning real pink. It's, I know. It's, 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 <laughs> Should I go back to no light? It's the, the lighting keeps changing over here because the sun's going down. No, I, no, I love that. I thought it was so cool. Right. Like, yeah, like I was like, you you match the cover, and it's like it's. I feel like you've got your own like filter right now. You have like um, an X Man moment, yeah. But yeah, but you also you join. I mean, what's also funny to me is that like all these authors on this trip, none of us have ever written about it like in a book. Like no one's ever told this like international dinner story. No one's ever made like a speculative like component out of it. Like we've all just kind of like experienced that trip, and we've just bottled it up. I guess like I don't yeah. I don't know. 
cost the German government a few thousand euros. And yes. <laughs> and out. like, I wasn't even published yet. Like I had literally <laughs> just gotten my first advanced copy for More Happy Than Not the day before I flew out to Germany. Amazing. So it was just sort of like. And Julie Murphy was in a similar situation, I feel like. Yeah, but, yeah, it was like, Side Effects May Vary was maybe about to come out or something. Yeah, it was so, it was so odd. Anyway, it was so fun. Okay. I was thinking about, about Pride, I, I was thinking one thing that was cool in, in Darkness Outside is writing about gay characters was imagining being gay 400 years from now. Like, so often, you know, we write about it like 20 years ago or, or yeah. right now, but this idea of like, like at one point Kodiak says, you know, like ask Ambrose, like, are you gay or bisexual? Or, and Ambrose just like busts out laughing. Cause he's like, he hasn't heard those words in real life, you know, except wow. for movies, right? Um, it's, they're just like so beyond it in his country. Yeah. It was fun wow. to play with some of that. Like what might the future look like? Uh, and it was- yeah. And I don't think you're you're wrong about that either. I do. Th I think that is probably a really accurate, um, you know, prediction for like how that's going to play out. Like it's already, you know, I still think about how my first goddaughter, you know, she's turning nine in December, but she saw me with like one of my boyfriends back in 2017, and like we were just holding hands. There was no conversation. Like she didn't care. Like she was not at all. Like she hadn't been raised to even kind of like second guess that. You know, um, and I was just like so relieved that I didn't have to like, you know, um, that no uncomfortable moment like resulted from that and everything. It was just like, I'm like, yeah, like kids are great. Kids don't give a shit uh, right. about this until they're taught to give a shit about it. And yep. uh, so yeah. Same thing with race, yeah. Uh, okay, I've got a couple questions. Uh, so um, this is like, a kind of like a craft question. Um, so, because when Ambrose wakes up on the coordinated endeavor, he has no memory of the launch for the rescue mission to like save his sister Minerva. Um, did you always want to like play around with memory um, and the absence of certain memories, uh, especially for someone like confined in a spaceship where like they can't access the answers as quickly uh, or like go talk to like a handful of other people? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. Great question. I. I think the thing I find amazing about a spaceship as a setting is that you have a, this enclosed space where you, you can't get outside of it. And there's ways in which, you know, authors manufacture that all the time. Like the hotel gets snowed in, so they're stuck, right? 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 They can't get away. And um, the spaceship is the ultimate version. Like you could open the door to find out what's outside, but you're dead. Like <laughs> it's over. Right. Right. So very, very high stakes. Right. <laughs> exactly. And like it really plays with your mind. But like we all have a version of that. And this is the thing I love about your books, Adam, is that you always tackle like a big philosophical question. Like what does it mean to live when you know you're gonna die? You know, like something as big as that would they both die at the end. Yeah. And for me, this one was, you know, how do we know, like, it's like the brain in the vat problem. Like how do we know that what we're experiencing is real? Like, or, or the matrix, you know? Right. Uh, and we don't get to get outside of this life to find out. Um, I mean, I guess we do eventually. Sure. Uh, <laughs> eventually. Just one chance to do that. Yeah. Um, and so for me, that was a really interesting question on the spaceship, especially because they can't even get outside to find out if their mission is real. Like if they are right. actually a way to get Minerva Cusk, if they are where they think they are in the solar system or the universe. Um, and so it gets as a way of like playing with perception and, and how do we know what we know and is it possible to ever be certain about it? Yeah. And just like love in the meantime, right? Can you... Can you commit to the life that you have, even if it's not necessarily, it doesn't feel real all the time. Yeah, you don't feel grounded in it. And, yeah. and just like, and you're questioning it, right? Like, I mean, yeah, it's, oh God. And then just like space, like, I mean, like what was the, was Gravity the one with Sandra Bullock? Yeah. Um, yeah, my God. Like, you gotta with Sand Sandra Bullock and not George Clooney. She is definitely the like. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. She no, but I was like, that was like, that trailer was like, that movie trailer was so stressful. And then you watch the movie and it's so stressful. Like space stresses me out. Like you are not going to like, Elon Musk needs to like calm down. Cause they're like, I'm not going to Mars. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm not making the trip. Like I am here. This is like where, I, this is just whatever's going to go down. Like this is, I'm part of it. But like, I, I just like, I, I feel like I watched all the space movies and they, stress me out like they're like they're horror movies uh for me i watched the most recent one on netflix with anna kendrick uh, which i don't know if you oh yeah stow away so yeah so that one i was just like oh my god like and then just like it was just it, was, it had such a like intense um dynamic going on like with all the characters as well and uh also like side note like it's 
odd watching Anna Kendrick like in a space movie that's like not like a comedy. <laughs> You're supposed uh, to be having fun, only. Yeah, it was just like, but it, it took, and she's a talented actress, obviously. Like, uh, but I was just like, it took me a minute to like really not expect like hijinks right, <laughs> um, right. on the spaceship. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, there's there's such a range in sci-fi. There's like the very, you have, you have versions of the really romantic version of space, which I love reading about, but where yeah. it's like, like that movie Passengers, you know, where it's right. like a giant, beautiful playground and like there's, you know, swimming pools. And yeah, uh, I was definitely more interested in the sort of more realistic, cramped spaceship. I was gonna uh, ask, yeah. Yeah, sharing tight quarters. Yeah. So uh, what kind of like research were you doing for this? Because I also know that like you, unlike me, We'll do more research uh, for a book um, than I will. Like I'm constantly just like I'm just make sure that um, you're and, doing that. It's it's good. It's working. Yeah. For you. Um, um, yeah, for me, research is it gets me out of like a cliched state of mind. Like I'll have certain plot tricks I turn to over and over, and research will give me elements that I can include that my brain wouldn't have come up with otherwise. Yeah, so it like it keeps me actually fresher instead of. I know research sounds like a stale thing, but it's it gets it gets more energy into the book for yeah. me. But for you, was it like watching a lot of like fiction movies? Was watching a lot of documentaries, reading a lot of books, chatting with people at NASA? Like, uh, yeah. Well, the, the one really cool thing is the, the openness of people at NASA to talking about their work and getting people to 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 spread the word. Um, I was at a teen book festival in Houston, and um, Cecil Castellucci and I just went to the space center and they took us around and like we could go in into all the like sort of sit inside the module mock-ups and all of that so that was a really cool way to sort of get to know what space would literally feel like and um, i had a, a nasa beta reader who gave me some some good advice on it uh, michael howard uh, who's thanked in the acknowledgments um yeah. so that was all all helpful research and then i read there's a lot of non-fiction speculative books that are about what would it be like to live on a spaceship and i think it's you know, some of the realities were way weirder than I ever would have thought about, which is, you know, for a really long range spacecraft, it would be what's called slow acceleration. So they would just take whatever trash or bodily fluids they weren't using on the spaceship and just like shoot them out the back. So it would just go like a little bit faster, but there's no friction in space. So everything you shoot out makes it a little bit faster over time. Okay. So they would just be like, shooting out like you know like water and poo and like slowly accelerating across the universe as like a booster yeah <laughs> that is oh uh, yeah no they didn't talk about that in star wars like no i don't talk about that in the book because it wasn't so romantic it was like you know hard to like get with the makeout scenes after yeah i feel like if you're writing like andy wears like the martian or something like that's exactly the kind of like oh, weird totally. detail that like he is going to incorporate and so grow potatoes in that poop yeah yeah, I remember just like seeing all that. I was just like, oh my god, they're really gonna make a movie out of this, um, and they they did, <laughs> uh, which is really good. Sorry, hi mom. I'm on. What's up? Sorry, my mom is like, visiting. Me right now. I can bring my mom in too. <laughs> okay, I am so sorry. I have to. I have to take my mom to the hospital. Oh my gosh! Right now. Yes. Um, so I guess Mysterious Galaxy is going to take over. Um, I'm so sorry. Oh, um, good luck. Go, just, God bless. Thank you. Okay, all right. I am so sorry. Elliot, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Yes, of course. Right. Bye. Hi. Hi. Switching oh, here. Um, I really hope everything's okay. I know. I hope so, too. Everyone mm -hmm. send out positive energy for Adam and yes. his mom. I am going to go ahead, since I see we have seven questions, I'm going to just go ahead and we can hop into the Q&A if that works for you, Elliot. Does that? That's great. Sweet. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, of course. So let's see. For You've touched a little bit on how um, on the namings, but maybe you can give a little bit more detail. But they were wondering, this is from Sophia. And their question is, how did you name the boys or where did the names actually come from? Um, yeah, naming characters is one of my favorite things. Um, and it is one of the least cerebral things that I do. Like, it's just like a mood and it just hits me and it comes out. And Ambrose, I wanted, you know, Ambrose is a name that men used to have like a hundred mm -hmm. years ago. And it's it's like one of those names that's like Leslie or Ashley that men used to have that has like mm -hmm. some, a delicateness to it um yeah. and, and I, I thought that kind of captured ambrose's essence really well and it was just like a nice word to look at it was sort of familiar but also like 
most of us don't have an Ambrose in our life. So it was also like a little bit surprising. Um, so yeah. I like having that combination. And Kodiak similarly, like makes me think of Frontier, like mm -hmm. the bear, you know, <laughs> like it was just like a, a, a tough name and uh, he's a tough guy. So um, it seemed like the right, the right name for him. Um, the country, um, yeah, I, I actually, the uh, Democratia and Federacion. Um, I have to listen to the audiobook and find out how the audiobook narrator did it uh, for those two names because there's accents in them. But um, those were just kind of, uh, I took inspiration from some root languages and then just like sort of came up with combinations of syllables that I thought were cool. What languages? I'm curious. Uh, Democratia, I was thinking, I looked up democracy in Greek mm -hmm. um, and then took it from there and like modified some bits of the word. Uh, and then federation is that federation was like federation in French, just with some French accents in there. And that was Ambrose's country, and it seemed right for this like you know poetic, super liberal guy to also, also like have a French sounding country. Have to give him all of the culture and everything. Right. I didn't give him a beret and a cigarette, but I, I might I could have. <laughs> Everyone just draw a little mustache and a little beret and everything. And they would have died for a baguette on the spaceship. Like they would have really loved a Nutella baguette. <laughs> <laughs> well, I anticipate a lot of really beautiful fan art for these two characters. So we're just going to put it out in the universe. And um, that's so interesting because I can't name anything. Even naming my cat gave me anxiety. So I'm jealous of your skill to be able to do that so easily. <laughs> and let's see, the next question we have. This is a question that I always like to ask. So guilty as charged, this is one that I threw in there. But this is, which scene or section brought you the most joy to write? And I always like to ask this because I feel like when people ask about writing, it's so easy to focus on like, what was the hard part? And I like to know what brought you the most joy about writing this book? Yeah, that's a very kind question, actually, because it, it's like sort of like, what are you most proud of? You know, yeah. that you get to, get to talk about that. Um, I... For the longest time when I wrote books, I would write from the beginning to the end and just mm -hmm. sort of like, by the end, I was like holding on and like hoping that like tomorrow I'll have an idea of what the last scene should be. Yeah. Um, this book was, was kind of the opposite. It has an ending that is a moment and an event that took the entire book's uh, narrative arc to get there. So it was like, uh, I feel like that final chapter is like a great dessert after you've had your dinner. You know, <laughs> like it is, it is not, it's not half dance. It's not like, oh yeah, this is like sort of a nice moment. And like, oh yeah, I guess the relationship is where it is. It's like a, I, I just, I can't, I can't give away spoilers. So no, just, of course. we'll see, you'll, it'll hit a chord and you'll be like, oh, um, the book got me ready for this. And I think that's what I'm most excited about. As a reader too though, having like, a very satisfying ending. There's just a very unique experience with that. So, oh, that makes me excited for everyone who's gonna like get to have that like beautiful moment when they come to it. It's also a very canny answer because now people have to finish the book. They can't put it down. Indeed, because we can't tell you what happens. You literally just have to read to figure it out. So, I mean, if you want the amazing moment in your life that you will be lacking if you don't now have, you just gotta read until the end. <laughs> I got a tweet last night from someone, actually one of my former students, I teach at the uh, an MFA for creative writing, and she had she was on page 150, and she had, by accident the book had fallen open, and she had seen the last line, and she oh, was yeah. like, wait, how do we get there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, <laughs> um, which that gave me. That makes me want to ask, I feel like this is a very controversial thing that people have opinions on. Do you ever look at the last page of a book? Or do you always, neither do I, I don't either, but some people do. And I'm like, I can't do it, but I always like to ask because I'm like, it just shows how all of our brains read books differently. Yeah, I understand why. I think it, I think people do it because they get really anxious about whether mm -hmm. they can work out for these characters and they, yeah. they need that anxiety to go away, like in order to enjoy the book. So I, I kind of get that. I get it too. I had, I, I cheated one time and I had to have a friend tell me that character I really liked wasn't gonna die and nothing else. And then I was able to read the series, but I was like, I just need to know from a mental health. Well, as someone who's written a lot of animal books, like people wanna know if the animal dies. Like before they're gonna commit to reading this thing, they wanna know, are you gonna old yeller me? Like, <laughs> 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 old yeller doesn't make it. <laughs> and this is horrible, but like, 
It's the truth. I care more about animals dying in fiction than I do about people sometimes. Maybe a lot of the times I'm like, no, I can take a human death better than an animal death. And I don't know why and I don't want to deep dive into it. But I think a lot of people out there also feel the same way. Oh, um, yeah. We have all sorts of barriers up towards people that we don't have up towards animals. I think. Very true. Uh, so our next question is from Mariana and they are asking, do you find it difficult to switch back and forth between such different genres, between like YA and middle grade, for example, and with different narrative voices? And then how do you find the voice when working on a new project? So kind of a bunch of things kind of mixed up in there, but. Um, um, I know it's actually my favorite thing about our job is that mm -hmm. we, like we don't go into the same office each day because I mean, literally we don't have to because we can go to a different coffee shop to work in. But what I really mean is like, we don't, like you have a mood and you're stuck with the mood for six months while you're drafting a book. And then if you're done with that mood, you get to pick up another one for the next book and it doesn't have to be the same. Um, yeah. ideally. So I- like the hop worlds. Yeah, I find I'm, I'm often rebounding. Like I really did write the Animal Rescue Agency book one then the darkness outside is, and then the animal rescue agency book too. And it was like, great. It was like, I'm having, I'm, I'm eating like a lemon square and now I'm having like a really rich brownie and now I'm going back to lemon squares, which makes all three of those better, right? It's like a little palate cleanser. Uh, excuse you, sir. I'm so sorry. That's my cat meowing. Uh, we have so many pets involved. Tonight. I know. Um, the next question that we have is without giving anything away, um, so let's go for a different section than the ending because this is a little similar to the question that I just asked you. But they said, what parts in the prose that you look back on and just think, wow, I'm really proud of writing that. So I know we touched on the end. So are there any other moments in there that just have a very warm place in your heart? These are such nice questions, everybody. Um, like what, what is positive? What do you love? Um, so I, there is a, uh, I played violin when I was back in my, I can't believe it's not a Republican teenage years. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I played violin and um, I gave, I, initially Ambrose didn't have violin on ship, but I, I gave him one um, and he plays um, some concertos, but often he'll just like, he gets really, he's like a little over dramatic compared to Kodiak and he'll like sort of like just bow out notes staring out into space and Kodiak's like, will you keep it down? Um, and so I, there's, there's a moments where they realize the, um, the violin is made of wood and it's the only thing that's organic on the ship other than themselves. And they're um. Yeah. And so they, they, Kodiak starts to like, the, the playing, like he, he kind of pretends because he wants Ambrose to feel good. He pretends he's to enjoy it, but he really just wants to hold the violin. And so they have these quiet moments, sort of like holding hands and also holding the wood that was a group for hundreds of years in a forest somewhere with squirrels jumping around. Um, and uh, just as a memory of real earth, especially once they're deep in the, the plot and they're not sure at all what's real. The ship's telling them the truth about what they're, what they're doing. Oh, that's beautiful. It's it's so easy to forget. I feel like obviously we're not in space, but like so many things are made from like plastic and other like non organic materials now that like just touching like a wooden desk or like there's a very beautiful tactile thing to that. Yeah, I think it's why we like buying distressed things like they're pre distressed. Mm -hmm. It makes it feel like a human has been involved with this and it's already had human contact and world contact because everything can feel too perfectly made and shiny surfaced. And it has a life already kind of embedded in it. Yeah. Oh, and speaking of, so this, not planned, but this works out beautifully. So we just mentioned the violin. This next question by Christine is, do you find inspiration in music? And if so, any songs that you connect with for Ambrose or Kodiak? Yeah. Um, so I had a playlist uh, for that was running on repeat when I was writing this book. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say it, it's, it's going to feel like, oh, yeah, of course, this book is so that artist. Um, but I ended up actually sending it to my editor, Ben Rosenthal, at Catherine Teagan Books to edit with. So we could have the same. Um, <laughs> That's great. I've never heard anyone do that before. <laughs> but it was um, Bjork, uh, Homogenic, um, yeah. her like, for, like first through fourth album. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, 
then I also, um, another artist that I really like is a, a queer artist who does a lot of kind of like moody, atmospheric uh, pieces. His name is Owen Pallet. Um, and I really, really like uh, his stuff. So I played a lot of Owen Pallet as well when I was when I was writing it. And now I have to ask, Fountain of Blood by Bjork is like, I used to listen to that song on like nonstop repeat, but oh. It's York is so it's cool. Such a, she's such a mood, though. Like, you're so right. She is. You don't need to understand what she's saying. Yeah. Well, there's something like, very beautiful and ugly about her music at all times. You know, so like, true. like there's so like, no softness, and yet it's like transporting and mm -hmm. welcoming. And you have this instrumental, but oh, but, and I feel like people always ask this with music as a follow up. Do you have a Spotify playlist or anything like that for this where people can go and actually? get into the experience as they read That's them. a great idea, um, and I do not. If you're reading, like, it's, it's, it's good reading music as well, so um, you, can, you can start there. Yeah, so everyone just start playing the Bjork, the fourth, I think it's the fourth album you said, as you read this, and you will have the perfect ambiance. I'm going to put homogenic and palette in the chat. And then... So I know that Adam already asked you about research, but Daphne is asking, oh, we got to upload on a question. I'll ask that one next, guys. But Daphne is asking if there's any research in particular on like space that you had to do for the story. I know you already mentioned the lovely uh, projectile way that a spaceship can go forward with getting rid of its weight Small acceleration yeah. Yeah. yeah but was there any other kind of like fun spacey things that you incorporated or more what i think is interesting anything where you found it but it was like a okay yeah that that's true but this is where i get to have fun and this is sci-fi and we're just going to ignore that yeah yeah totally i mean there's there's many 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 pages that were cut because they mm -hmm. were Nonfiction, just in, like just sort of like explorations of how something worked on the ship. Yeah, and I had a rule for myself that if any of that material could go, like if mm -hmm. the story stood without knowing that, then I I cut it. So, I, I took out a lot of sort of nuts and bolts about how the ship works, just to stay focused on these two characters and the story they were going through. Um, but there were elements that did survive because they could be like um just part of a sentence, um, and so it would just be part of how this, how it all works. So, there's two things that come to mind. One is that um, in submarines, when they're on a long submarine voyage, they, they have um, the, the, the floor that they're standing on can be peeled up like a rubber mat and the food is underneath. And so, what? yeah, so when they're, when they're cooking in a submarine, they'll just like peel up the floor on one of the decks and then like, get this pouch of food or a can of food and then put, the, put it down. And so slowly the floor lowers um, by like a foot over time because they're eating all the food under the floor. Uh, that is <laughs> So trippy. My, yeah, I mean, that's how like, you're stepping on your food. That's so unsanitary. Yeah. Like a storage space that you need, um, but under your feet is actually a pretty good place. So, no, I, that, and that's in the that's in the book. Um, and then, uh, oh, another thing is, you know, in YA, especially speculative mm -hmm. young adult, um, you find teenagers are there because the book needs it to be teenagers because it's the YA, yeah. book. and like it doesn't really make sense for it to be teenagers saving the world and not. 25 year olds or 35 year olds. Yep. I did find a lot of um, uh, articles on on the various ages about going to space to travel to say settle Mars um, and who would survive the journey best and do best on Mars. And um, one of the big dangers in space is that without an atmosphere, all the tiny particles from space can come through and hit your body and they, they ping your DNA. So like, you can get uh, tumor growth and cancer very easily. Uh, and so younger people have a more innate resistance to developing cancers. So um, actually sending teenagers on this journey makes a lot of sense because they'd be much more likely to survive. Whereas older astronauts getting this much radiation for that long yeah. uh, would actually have a much harder time of it. So it made sense that there were 17 year olds. Um, Sacrifice the youth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what am I saying? <laughs> Wait, so where's all the radiation coming from? Is it just from like in general in space, lots of radiation just yeah, going on? The suns and all the quasars and all the pulsars, they're, they're emitting radiation. All, most of the celestial bodies that we can see are also like sending out these HZE particles. Um, and they're hitting Earth, but our atmosphere is thick enough that they all get stopped by yeah. uh, in the oxygen in our atmosphere. So, um, but in space, they don't have an atmosphere to block it, so they just hit your body. 
Oh my gosh, that's so, I hadn't even thought about that. No. Woo. I'm not happy that I'm older, and I'm no longer in that realm where you could send me to Mars to colonize. Yes. Also, too, I, I am not that adventuresome. I'm with Adam where that would give me severe anxiety. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I want to go to space either. I just want to write about it. <laughs> well, my whole family does, though. They love science. So I will I will lose my family to space if it ever becomes possible. Um, this next question, I, I always love these kinds of questions. And it is, Elliot, would you rather be stuck on a spaceship with Kodiak or with Ambrose? Do you want silence and brooding, or do you want beautiful violin concertos? Um, gosh, uh, I I would choose to be with Ambrose on a spaceship, not with Kodiak. Um, Kodiak takes a lot of work, <laughs> and I don't know what this voyage is going to involve if we have to collaborate right from the beginning. Um, but it takes Ambrose a very very long time to get Kodiak in a place where he is a good partner on this ship. Yeah, and so he might be super broody, handsome warrior boy, but I think Ambrose is the one. And we could, you know, we could play violin duets because I play violin too. This is true. Yeah, and, and uh, that would be a lot more fun than having to peel the layers of the ogre. You're like, you're a very attractive ogre, but still, but still, poke, 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 poke. Right. <laughs> Which is very fun in a book, and maybe in real life, just don't choose the ogre. <laughs> but but that's why I love books. You're like, this situation totally works. We don't even need to think about reality on it. <laughs> and ooh, this is a, another fun one. And it is, what are some of the biggest sci-fi uh, influences that you've had or like favorite authors? Oh. Um, I really love everything Melinda Lowe writes. So mm -hmm. she's a big inspiration. Um, when I was a teenager, I read um, a lot of Arthur C. Clarke, uh, and you can see parts of 2001 and 2075 in this book. Um, that there is like this this feeling of like being being on a mission about and something that is greater than humanity is behind the mission um, is is kind of part of part of that. I think it's big inspiration as well. Um, and then let's, oh, you guys really wanted to know if you would pick Kodiak or Ambrose. That was on here twice. Um, <laughs> I'm curious what the audience would pick. Maybe you can Ooh, put the chat, team, yes. team Kodiak. Or Everyone in the chat, write who you would wish to be stuck with. I'm very, I'm also very excited to see where that one would go. Yeah. yeah. And people like, to be good information, actually. I think I need to know this. And then the last two questions we have are more on writing process. And this one is what motivates you to write and how do you find time to write? I think um, motivation in general for writers and figuring it out, how can I incorporate that into my actual like daily life is always a big question that I see pop up in events. That's a great one. And it is kind of like the question, right? Mm -hmm. because yeah. I think, you know, ideas and talent are a little bit more common than work ethic as far as writing yeah. is concerned. And like the work ethic is usually the thing that has to be worked on the most to get this done. Um, and with enough time and energy, like you'll, you'll get your writing in the right place if you have the, the grit to stick with it. Um, for me, uh, what's really key for that is making my goals as short term and practicable as I can. So mm. that I'm thinking like, Today, I'm going to write 750 words. And I'm, I'm yeah. going to leave the house because I know I'm going to, if I stay home, I'm just going to play PlayStation today. <laughs> so I'll leave the house with my laptop and say, like, I, I imagine, like, you know, like Jack and the Beanstalk, his mom, like, don't come home without a, you know, a cow. Yeah. Um, I imagine, like, some voice saying behind me, don't come home without 750 words. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit down in the coffee shop and I will have to get those 750, 750 words in order to come home. So yeah. it's, true yeah i think like a highly developed guilt complex is basically pretty essential for a writer like i feel guilty if i don't get anything done because i know i've been given a huge gift just by living a life that gives me any hours to write um and i wasting that would be like a, a really wasteful thing to do so, mm -hmm. so develop a highly developed guilt. <laughs> and i think that's such a I think that's so important just because for the amount of authors that like just from working at a bookstore have gotten to see and meet 
at first I think people, it's easy to like romanticize anything in the arts, but writers have some of the most incredible dedication and work ethic. And a lot of the times they're writing while also doing another job. So I always have an insane amount of respect for the dedication that you guys have towards getting in your word counts and making sure you're consistently putting in the work. Yeah. So just yeah, ignore, ignore me. I'm not ignoring this is amazing. We have good cat energy going on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I sometimes keep tabs on like scenes that I've written when I would, was not in the mood to write and scenes that I've written when I was in the mood to write. And because yeah. I was suspecting maybe when I'm in the mood, I'm writing better. And mm. actually I find it's like 50, 50, like sometimes I write great stuff, even though I'm like, <sighs> like, I don't want to be here. And sometimes I write bad stuff, even though I was inspired. So it's all useful work time. I think no matter what your mood is going in. And we've all had that beautiful moment where you're like, I'm a genius. And then you look back and you're like, dear God, whether it's for work, for writing, whatever, you're like, I thought I was the best thing in sliced bread and time has an interesting way of sometimes changing what you've written. Change your mind in time. <laughs> and this, this is gonna go ahead, we'll have this be our final question, but this is now that you've written The Darkness Outside Us, are you feeling inspired to write more stories in space? And I'm wondering if you also, if we have more YA coming from you as well. Definitely more YA coming from me. Yay. Um, I have a YA nonfiction book coming out next summer called uh, Queer Ducks, and it is about same-sex sexual behavior within the animal kingdom, um, which there's been a huge explosion of research in the last 20 years that mm -hmm. I would have wanted to read about when I was a teenager to like mm -hmm. feel like not alone in my gayness. So um, it's uh, that's coming out. That's YA nonfiction coming out next year, but there'll be other YAs. Um, as far as like science fiction, I you know I have a like sort of what the first chapters of a sequel would look like for darkness outside us um and i can't say anything about it because it would spoil the reading of this first book but it does sort of it's rattling in my mind so if it warrants a sequel which i would i should be so lucky um if it, it warrants, warrants a sequel <laughs> if it did i i have a sense of what it might look like at least for the start i'm not sure what the the whole playthrough would be well, as someone who has been reading like all of the comments, there has been nothing. Yes, exactly. Christine, see the, wait, 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 a sequel? That has <laughs> been the response. I've heard nothing but- I will reiterate, it's not written yet. <laughs> but it, there is like, you know, little few synapses firing. But there out. is a demand. So there is a demand <laughs> out there. <laughs> the lightness, the inside, lightness us. inside us. Oh! Thank you, Melody. That's great. Um, that's so, oh my gosh, that's so sweet. But, um, so I know I asked kind of what you have coming out, or that's kind of where the last question took us. Do you have any other announcements and or bookish things that you would like to share with anyone? Well, I have one, which is that we are so lucky that bookstores like the Serious Galaxy have survived the hardest time in their history as businesses. And it is an amazing gift back for the work they did over these last few months to buy books from them. They make it so easy uh, mm -hmm. and they will ship for free, I think over $50, right? The Serious Galaxy, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which is great. And you are supporting independent bookstores, which huge amounts to support authors as well and all of us. So buy all your books from them. I mean, one of them should be mine, mm -hmm. Adams. Um, they both die at the end if you haven't read it yet. I'm sure everyone here has, like, go buy it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but thank you, Mysterious Galaxy, for, for holding up our industry. Um, You're gonna make me cry on screen. That's not okay. okay. <laughs> thank you so incredibly much for that. And also to thank you, also a big thank you from us to like authors like Elliot. Um, who just support the indies so much. That means that means more than you guys know. And on that note, now that I'm sappy and sentimental about the amazing of authors and indie bookstores and all the readers who support us, I also wanna give a shout out because this is Pride Month and we are insanely excited um, to get to support diversity and representation at the store. So the darkness outside us, guys, go out and buy this phenomenal book. And also I'm gonna do a little promo. We have space pins that we are doing as a fundraiser where all of the proceeds get donated to um, the community, which is an LGBTQ organization in San Diego. Um, and it's a little space pin where they're holding the um, 
the updated flag and everything. So guys, thank you so much for joining. Oh, it makes me so happy. It's so cute. But <laughs> but thank you all so much for joining us. Um, the Darkness Outside Us, as you've probably seen in the comments, is just a ridiculously amazing book. So I can't recommend that you go and read it enough. And thank you so much, Elliot, for joining us. And we will see you all next time. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and happy weekend, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. It's been your with us. Thanks. Bye.